Hi everyone. Can you see me properly? Um, please let me know in the chat section if you can hear me well. Great. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Women of Men and Technology event hosted by San Francisco Bay Area team. My name is Hannah Kalantari, and I'm part of this amazing team along with Sarvanaz and Sahar. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar. Um, let me give you a little bit introduction about our organization. Women of Mennine Technology is a nonprofit organization established in Silicon Valley in 2015 with the mission to close the diversity and gender gap in STEM by connecting, mentoring, educating, and elevating Middle Eastern and North African women in STEM globally. As technology becomes more integrated in our society and creates a new paradigm, it is up to us to be intentional about equity, inclusion, and diverse representation in the space. That's why we are here. Um, we have over 35,000 community members. We have different programs. We're having our fourth annual Women of Men in Tech conference coming up on November 4th and 5th. Uh, this year, the theme is Accelerate MENA. Uh, last year, we had uh, over 11,000 attendees online through Hopping platform. And uh, we have uh, speakers um, all over the world and we have uh, our career and exhibit halls. Last year, we partnered with 15 organizations and we would like to double up this number this year. So if you like to support our community, if your companies are interested in sponsoring or if you'd like to be our community partner, please email us at conference at womenofmenitechnology.com. Uh, we will write down the emails and the, uh, the links in the chat section and you will have that. We are also looking for a few committee members. Please send us your resume with your LinkedIn to the same email address, uh, conference at womenofmenandtechnology.com. Also, we are looking for ambassadors in the MENA region to support our conference. If you know anyone that would like to be ambassador in the MENA region, if you'd like to connect us to anyone related and they're interested in supporting us, please email us. Uh, we are launching a very interesting program called Code Mena, a free tuition bootcamp. If you have any question regarding this uh, um, bootcamp, please email us at info at codemena.io. Or you can email us, our team, at bayarea at womenofmenaintechnology.com and we can forward your email to the right department. Uh, we have our city events. All of our city events through pandemic is online. So it's the perfect time to take advantage of this um, situation. And if your time, time zone allows, you can um, join our online events uh, in different cities. We have our mentorship programs. If you'd like to become a mentor or a mentee, our mentorship program would be great for you. We also have our mobile application that is part of our membership program. Uh, if you get membership, we will have access to many different programs. We have different membership levels. And for more details, please check out our website, womenofmenainintechnology.com. We are also looking for team members. If you are interested in joining our amazing San Francisco Bay Area team, please send us your resume at bayarea at womenofmenainintechnology.com. If you send us your uh, LinkedIn and a little bit bio about yourself, that would be great. If you are from different cities and you would like to join other teams, you can also send us email and we can forward your email to the right city. If you have any questions, any concern, any feedback, any comments, please feel free to email us and we'll be happy to connect with you. Today, we have a webinar on entrepreneurship and innovation, which is one of my favorite topic with our incredible speaker, Dr. Homa Bahrami. Uh, let me introduce her a little bit because she has the long resume and of course, a lot of accomplishments that takes forever if I tell all of it, but 
Just to give you a short bio about her, she's an international educator, advisor, board member, and author, specializing in organizational flexibility, organizing in the digital age, team alignment, and the dynamic leadership in global knowledge-based industries. She is a senior lecturer and a distinguished teaching fellow at the Haas School of Business, University of California, Berkeley, a faculty director at the Haas Center for Executive um, Education, and has served on the board of Haas Center for Teaching Excellence. Uh, with that said, I would like to invite Dr. Homa to the stage and I will leave the stage and I'll be back for the Q&A section. Please, after the webinar, if you have any questions, we have a Q&A section and please write down your question in the chat and we will ask it. So please enjoy this webinar and thank you again for joining. Um, Dr. I'm not sure is Dr. Homa, are you on the stage now? Okay. Hello. Hi, perfect. Okay, we okay. made it. Yes, <laughs> yes, we did it. All right, I'll give you the stage and I will leave. I'll be back for the Q&A. Okay, well, thank you thank for that introduction. And thank you for the patience. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you. Um, it's My name is Homa Barami. I am a professor at the Haas School of Business, UC Berkeley, as Hannah mentioned, and it's a pleasure to be with you. And I love the idea of Amina and the women in technology. I think this is a wonderful time for your generation to be involved in entrepreneurship and innovation and think about technology. Um, tell you a little bit about myself, just to put things in context. My, uh, I wear three different hats. My first hat is as an educator. My, I have been at Berkeley for a long time and I have been very fortunate to have taught many different students who've gone on to become uh, very respected leaders, not just in tech, but in industry in general. My second hat is as a researcher, as an author. I specialize in organizational flexibility in dynamic knowledge-based industries. And my third hat is as a board member, as an advisor. I spend a lot of my time um, really trying to link uh, research and know-how with action and implementation. And when you sit on a board, when you're an advisor, you really have to make sure that your ideas are practical, implementable. And when I was asked by Mina to have a session with you on innovation and entrepreneurship, I thought, what a wonderful opportunity to get to know women who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow and driving many of the innovations that are going to become the backbone of our new economy and the new environment. My style is very interactive. I have to say, this is the first time I'm using this hop-in platform. So please bear with me. I think there may be some technical challenges that I might have. But I just was wondering, um, wanted to ask you a very simple question. The session is about innovation and entrepreneurship. Let me ask you this question. What does innovation mean to you? And I don't know if you have an opportunity to put things in chat, but if you do, I would love to hear your perspective because we use this word innovation to mean very different things. And I want to see what it actually means to you. And is there a way that I can see the chat? Should I click on chat? Okay, I don't seem to be able to click on chat, but let's see. Uh, okay, I was going to show you some slides, but as I said, given the technical glitches, it's probably easier just to talk to you about it and address any questions that you may have. The first thing I want to start with you is I think today innovation is a huge opportunity because we live at a societal inflection point. What is the inflection point we're living in? It is... Um, 
three sets of factors that are driving massive change in our societies. Number one, digital acceleration. Even before COVID hit, um, sorry, I'm being given some instructions to go to stage section, top right of the screen and click on that. Thank you for bearing with me. As I said, this is the first time um, that I am using this platform and it is not clicking for me. Anyway, never mind. Um, Q and A. Let's see. I hope that we can see something. If we can't see something, if somebody can help me, um, give me some feedback about the questions that are coming up. As I said, I'm having some technical glitches. My apologies. But let's go back. Let me just talk, and uh, we'll keep it simple. Um, we're living at a key inflection point in society. Three forces are triggering this change. Number one, digital acceleration. You know better than anyone that during the last 10 years, we have implemented so many digital tools and technologies that are creating a new inflection point in our society. Number two, COVID and remote work. One chief information officer said to me, we have experienced digital acceleration in 16 months equivalent to 10 years because everybody's had to adopt new technologies to work from home. And thirdly, and very importantly, and this brings me to you, the younger generation of leaders that are emerging and driving a new way of doing things. I see that myself in my students, and I see how passionate and committed they are to drive new ways of working, new ways of interacting, and new ways of doing things. Now, if you take these three forces and you add to it some of the contextual and societal changes that we're experiencing, on top of that, we are seeing climate change. We are seeing the whole impact of the diversity and inclusion movement. So on top of the technology aspect of innovation, we're also seeing new trends and new developments that are driving us to think about living, operating, working in a new way. And that really brings us to the theme of innovation and entrepreneurship. So what is innovation? There are three things we think about. Number one, innovation is about creativity. It's about finding new solutions to problems. It's about challenging status Let's give you a few examples, a few examples you may be very familiar with. Think about 2007 when the iPhone first came in. What was the creativity that Steve Jobs and his team at Apple brought to the iPhone? It was putting everything in one device. Before that, you had your BlackBerry for your emails, you had your Nokia phone for your cell phone. You had your laptop for your email. You had your browser on your laptop. So what iPhone did as an innovation is brought together several different things that used to exist in disjointed pockets. This is creativity. This is thinking fresh. This is thinking a new way of solving a problem. The second component of innovation is about execution. So it's easy to come up with good ideas. As somebody said, it's 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. So the second key component of innovation is how you make it happen. Now, what is the third component of innovation? It is commercialization. If you're a for-profit corporation and you're driving innovation to make money, then you need to know how your innovation is going to generate those financial results. Of course, if you're in a non-profit concept like MENA, for example, then you only worry about the first two components, innovation, novel thinking, challenging the status quo on the one hand, 
and making it happen, execution on the other hand. So keep these three themes in mind as we go through the session, because I think a lot of the time, a lot of innovations that fail only address one of these three components. They very good idea, but it doesn't get executed well. Or if it's a for-profit corporation, they may execute really well, but they can't make any money out of it. So these are the three legs of the innovation angle that I think it's very important to keep at the back of our mind. The second part I want to share with you has to do with theories of innovation. I'm not going to make this overly academic and abstract, but I do want to tell you that it's very important to understand some of the foundational concepts that are driving innovation today. So one of the oldest ideas about innovation came from Joseph Schumpeter in the 1930s, and he was an Austrian banker. And he saw a whole wave of innovation come about during the 1930s uh, when there was the Great Depression. So Schumpeter came up with the notion of creative destruction which means that for new things to come about, something has to be destroyed. And of course, he was talking in the 1930s, so it is clear that at that time, the depression was taking place, and at the same time, new technologies, for example, television, the genesis of television came about during the 1930s out of the Great Depression. The second key idea I want to share with you that, you know, goes back a long way, goes back to the early 70s, and it is the work of um, Eric von Hippel at MIT. And Eric von Hippel basically came up with the idea that for innovation to take root, you need to find what he called your lead users or your early adopters. This is something that every startup today thinks about. When you start a new organization or a new company, the first thing you think about, who are going to be the early adopters that are going to use my technology? Who do you think were the early adopters of the iPhone back in 2007? Believe it or not, there were young people aged between 14 and 24 because this was a super cool technology. I remember my own son, who at the time was a teenager, basically queuing up in order to get one of these Apple iPhones. So Eric von Hippel's notion of identify your early adopters, the people who are going to be willing to take a chance on you and adopt your service or your technology. Now, the third key idea that I want to share with you has to do with disruptive innovation. And this came about uh, through the work of a professor called Clay Christensen at Harvard Business School. And this was back in the late 90s. And what Clay Christensen came up with was he looked at many different innovations in the storage industry, in the disk drive industry. And he realized that while there were some very successful big corporations in that space, a lot of the new innovations were coming from startups. So Clay Christensen's interesting theory was that the reason the startups are so successful in driving new things and challenging the status quo is because they don't have any baggage. They don't have any history. They don't have an existing business to protect. And they can start basically with a clean sheet. Bigger corporations, on the other hand, have a lot more resources, but they are basically kept in check by the legacy of their existing products, existing markets, existing systems, and they cannot pull themselves back and think out of the box. One of my colleagues, Hank Chesbra at Berkeley back in 2003-04 came up with a fourth key idea 
that drove the whole innovation space. And this is the notion of open innovation. The idea here is that if you want to truly innovate, you've got to collaborate with other people. And open innovation means you've got to basically network with others. Some of them may be even your competitors. Certainly you want to collaborate and co-create with your customers. So open your doors, open your gates and start looking for partners who can co-create with you. Now, my own work with my colleague, Professor Stuart Evans from Carnegie Mellon University has really focused on how does Silicon Valley innovate? And many of these ideas are captured in the book that Hannah mentioned, which is super flexibility for knowledge enterprises. We have had the good fortune of living in Silicon Valley for several decades now, since the 1980s. And, you know, we have seen many different startups. We have seen innovations come and go. We have seen innovations succeed and fail. We have seen startups start from nothing and become giant corporations. In fact, I remember when I was at Stanford Business School, uh, my first email account was given to me by Sandy Lerner, who was the IT manager at Stanford Business School, and she went on to become the co-founder of Cisco, which of course today is a multi-billion dollar corporation. So one of the observations that Stuart Evans and I had was that innovation does not need to be completely new. You can innovate by putting together existing components. There is a really famous example of this that I think might bring this to life. Think about Henry Ford and Ford Motor Company. Now go back a hundred years and think about the development of the car, which was the big innovation at the beginning of the 20th century. Why was Henry Ford so successful? in basically making the car a commodity that every person could afford to buy or most people could afford to buy. Because before Henry Ford and before Ford Model T, which was the first mass produced car, cars were a huge luxury. They were handcrafted like handmade clothes. So given the fact that uh, it was so expensive to make cars and it was obviously expensive to buy cars. Ford came up with the idea, how can I make this easier to produce, mass produce it and make it available for others, for the masses to buy. One of his family members worked in a meat slaughtering house. And this family, uh, Ford, visited this family member one day at the slaughterhouse and saw the carcass of meat go through several stages of production, ending up in the meat that would then go to shops and supermarkets and consumers would buy. So Ford thought this is a brilliant idea. Why don't we adopt this assembly line concept in the car industry? And the rest is history. So Ford was the first company to basically pioneer and adopt the assembly line systems for making cars. And assembly line means that, you know, it goes through several stages of production and you standardize the production process. So what Stuart and I saw in Silicon Valley was that many innovations that come about here are not actually new. Uh, they are recycled, and we call this flexible recycling. You know, again, a famous example of this is in the computer industry and Apple back in 1984, when Apple first introduced the Macintosh, which became a huge blockbuster in the industry and a huge, huge innovation, because for the first time, you didn't have to type all these commands. You could use a handheld mouse in order to drive the operation of your computer. But where did Steve Jobs get that idea from? He didn't sit there and sort of brainstorm it from scratch. He visited Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center and he 
was looking around and seeing some innovations that they were developing at Xerox at the time. And he basically came across the handheld mouse concept. He adapted it, he reshaped it, and he basically leveraged it to come up with the Macintosh, which was the first super easy to use laptop. And in fact, I remember the motto of Apple at the time was technology for the rest of us. Technology that is so easy to use that anybody can use it. So these are some of the key theoretical ideas behind the development of innovation. A lot of innovation comes out of pressure, destruction, just like Schumpeter said in the 30s. You need to think about your lead users, your super users, your early adopters, because in innovation, you're not going to find everybody rushing to your door and buying your product as soon as you bring it out. You have to think about the fact that as a startup, you have a real advantage in being agile and developing something new compared to the existing players who have a lot more resources, but they also have a lot of inertia. Partner with your customers and your stakeholders in order to co-create new innovations. And then um, our concept of flexible recycling that look around for new innovate for new existing ideas. And sometimes innovation comes by combining existing things that are already there, but you put them together in a novel way. And of course, iPhone is the most famous example of this. So now let's pause for a moment and think about how does the Silicon Valley model of innovation work for startup? I would imagine many of you are either thinking about doing startups or working for a startup or having a role in innovation in some capacity in a mid-sized company or in a large corporation. The first thing to remember from the practical application of innovation is what we call the three U's. What you need to create a successful entrepreneurial innovative startup is urgent need. That's the first U. Second U is unique product or service, something that nobody else is doing. And thirdly, a unified team. So as any of you, if you're thinking about starting your own businesses and starting your own company, these are the three things to think about. Um, what is an urgent need, an urgent problem that somebody has? What is unique about what I have to offer? And how do I assemble a team in order to be able to drive this particular innovation and bring it to fruition? So all of you need to think about the three U's as you're thinking about whether innovation inside an existing corporation or innovation inside um, a startup. Now, moving on, and again, my apologies, I had prepared a whole set of slides, but again, <laughs> given the technical challenges, we have to improvise and do the best we can. Um, let me tell you about features of entrepreneurship in successful startups. The first thing you have to think about when you're thinking about a startup is your motivation as the entrepreneur. Who are you? What makes you tick? Why do you want to do this? Do you have a passion for this idea or do you just want to make money? Tuning in to your own motivation as an entrepreneur is really important for your success. I have come across many entrepreneurs who have not succeeded because they really didn't understand why they wanted to do it. They thought it was kind of a fashion. Everybody else is doing it, so let me jump on the bandwagon. It is really challenging. It's really difficult to be an entrepreneur and to basically do a startup. You face a lot of problems. You um, experience a lot of setbacks. You've got to get up the next day and say, I've got to get up and go. 
So if you really don't understand why you're doing it and what makes you tick, you're not able to endure all of those challenges that you face in a startup situation. Number two, put together a small team and ideally a team that complements you, but you have similar values and vision for success. Some of the biggest problems I've seen in startups in entrepreneurial settings has to do with the chemistry between the core team. We don't get along, egos get in the way, um, roles overlap, and there's basically a fallout. So my, my apologies, I think my screen went blank for a moment, so you probably didn't see it. Um, your team is really, really important and don't rush to build a big team. This is a big mistake that I see many entrepreneurs make. Uh, you start building a big team from ground zero, coordination gets in the way, chemistry gets in the way, egos start clashing, it's difficult to communicate and so on. So secondly, a very small core team that has trust, that has complementary chemistry and complementary set of skills. Number three, leverage the infrastructure and the network. Don't try to do everything yourself. One of the biggest advantages of an entrepreneurial ecosystem like Silicon Valley is that you have a lot of people who have complementary capabilities. So for example, if you are a product designer or you're a programmer and this is your core capability, don't feel that you've got to bring in a financial expert on board from ground zero. You don't need that. You can outsource that. You don't need somebody to help you with marketing and sales. You can leverage contractor pools. But the core team has to really focus on the core capability of the organization or the team and not waste its limited resources on a lot of adjacent activities that you need. You can contract those out. You can use um, you know, vendor services, but don't bring it in-house too quickly. Number four identify your early adopters. Remember the lead user concept that I was mentioning before? Look at your market and say, who are the people who are going to use my technology or my product or my service first? I mentioned in the case of the iPhone, it was 14 to 24 year olds. Let's take the example of Netflix. What did Netflix target as its early adopters when it first got going back in 1997? Uh, many of you are too young to remember, but in 1997, when Netflix got started, it did not start with streaming services. It started by mailing DVDs in the mail to customers and the early adopters were Bay Area customers, San Francisco Bay Area customers, because they live close by and they could use um, those services effectively. So if you don't think about your early adopters or some call them power users or the target persona that you're going after, it's going to be very difficult for you to satisfy everybody's needs. So some of the more recent examples, you know, think about Facebook. Who were some of the early adopters of Facebook, for example? As you know, Facebook came out as initially a dating app for young people in university dorms to get to know each other. It iterated, it evolved, it adapted its model over time. But initially, the target users were younger people. And over time, it became global and it embraced a much bigger user community. But you have to start by identifying your early adopters. Who are the people who are going to pay money or be willing to take a risk with an unproven technology? 
Number five, and this is really, really key. Make sure that your solution is solving a real problem, that it is not something that is a nice to have rather than a must have. And that's why your target customer is really, really important. Uh, who you initially select to be your lead users or your early adopters. Other things to keep at the back of your mind, experiment, think like a scientist. One of the things that we find is really challenging for startups is ideas don't stay fixed. You have to pivot. You have to take feedback from your early adopters, from your users, from your customers, from the market, and iterate your approach and pivot your approach. This is exactly what scientists do, if you think about it. Scientists start with a hypothesis. They set up multiple pilots and experiments. They take feedback from those experiments. They recalibrate and evolve their approach. They don't sit there and come up with a big bang solution and implement that solution. You know, a historic example of this is Thomas Edison. Um, how many experiments did Thomas Edison engage in to come up with the light bulb? More than a thousand. So as an entrepreneur, your role is to constantly, constantly take that feedback and think about how you can improve and iterate the service or the product that you are delivering. And last, by no means least, your mindset, your attitude as an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs are optimistic. Entrepreneurs think that they're going to succeed. Entrepreneurs do not shy away from failure. In fact, entrepreneurs from a mindset point of view have five very important qualities. Number one quality is resilience. They experience problems, but they get up the next day and bounce back. A little bit like a starfish. If you think of a starfish, you can chop off one of its arms and it regrows another one. Another mindset that you need to have as an entrepreneur is the mindset of being able to interact and communicate with very different stakeholders. It's what we call versatility. One minute you're talking to potential investors. The next minute you're talking to potential customers. The third minute you're trying to recruit people on your team and you're trying to persuade them to join you. You're having all these different stakeholders and you have to flex and adapt your style to suit these different requirements. You're wearing multiple hats. As one entrepreneur said to me, you know, I am the janitor as well as the visionary. So you have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and do different things and do take whatever it takes to get the job done. So that mindset of flexing your style and wearing those different hats becomes really critical for your success. And the third important mindset that you need to have is to look around corners and be a little bit paranoid. Andy Grove, who was the CEO of Intel for more than 20 years and is known as a visionary behind Intel's success, wrote a really interesting book in the 1990s called Only the Paranoid Survive. I really recommend this book if you're interested in innovation and entrepreneurship, because basically his premise is that for you to succeed in innovation and entrepreneurship, you need to have slight paranoia. And paranoia means always look around corners. Don't just think about the best case scenario. Also think about the worst case scenario. And what is your backup plan if the worst case happens? So having a mindset of resilience, looking around corners and hedging your bet, and being versatile and flexing your muscle 
uh, in order to wear different hats and deal with different audiences effectively becomes really key for your success. And finally, I would like to sort of mention that the other piece of advice I have for all of you who are thinking about careers or as entrepreneurs, as innovators in your own startup, joining a startup, working with big corporations as innovators, is really think about which of these three mindsets you're bringing to the party. Are you naturally resilient? Are you a naturally a hedger? You think about the best case and the worst case. Are you naturally a versatile communicator who can interact with many different audiences? Think about that. Think about that skill set that you're bringing to the party and how you're going to show up as a member of the team to provide added value. The final point I want to make is I want to give you a very simple tool that I hope will help you think about your entrepreneurial plans as you're thinking about the next phase of the journey. When we look at successful entrepreneurs, they use a very simple tool. It's got three parts to it. Part one is what is your vision for success? Where is this innovation or this startup driving towards? What does success look like? Think about your vision. If I do this startup, I want in five years time for us to have reached this milestone. So that putting on your visionary hat and thinking about what success looks like at the end of the day is really important. I was speaking this morning to an entrepreneur in Norway um, in the clean energy business. And this is a fairly young startup that is leveraging some new technologies to make some big innovations in wind farms using wind technology to generate energy. And he was telling me that his vision for success was that his company's unique technology and unique approach is going to be so critical to success of so many other players that they are going to become the center of the ecosystem and partner with many other bigger corporations. His vision for success was not to create and scale a huge corporation. It was to become a partner of choice for many companies that want to leverage their unique technology and approach. Now, that may be very different from the vision of another entrepreneur who says, I want to create the next billion dollar company. So, Part one of the tool is your vision for success. Part two is the strategy that you're going to use in order to reach that vision. Think of yourself as a driver. When you get in a car and you drive a car, what do you think about? You think about the destination you're going to move towards. And that is equivalent to the vision. The destination is like your vision. This is where I want to get to. But the way you get to your destination is by choosing a particular route, a particular driving path that is going to get you there. And this is what we mean by strategy. What is your strategy? Who are going to be your early adopters? Who is your initial target market? How are you going to sell this product to that target market? So your strategy is really about the path to success. And as you drive your strategy, you need to really remember that you need to constantly pivot. You need to take the feedback and evolve and adapt your strategy. Your vision may be somewhat fixed and stable, but your strategy has to evolve and adapt. Now, the third component of this tool that I want to share with you is your tactics. The step-by-step -step approach that you take in order to get to your goal. So you might say, 
Step number one is I need to put together a business plan. Step number two is I need to be uh, raising some money, some seed funding to get the team recruited and to get going. Step number three may be to identify two or three early adopters, lead users that you can interact with to develop the first version of your service or your product. So remember this framework, vision, strategy, tactics, as a way of thinking about how you're going to take your dream or your vision for success and make it a reality. So I'm going to wrap up at this stage because I really want to hear your questions and I want to get to the point when we can address those questions. Um, I want to wrap up by telling you a very famous quote that I think is particularly relevant for this topic of innovation and entrepreneurship. And the quote comes from somebody who wrote a book which became incredibly influential a long time ago in 1858, and his name was Charles Darwin. And the book was called The Origin of Species. Darwin said back in 1858, it is not the strongest or the most intelligent that ultimately survive. It's the most adaptable. So as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, the strongest capability you can bring to the party, in my view, is to have an open mind, to be a sponge, to learn from everyday experiences, to listen to diverse points of view before you make up your own mind. Because at the end of the day, to be a successful innovator and entrepreneur, you have to go through lots and lots of setbacks. You have to fall down many, many times and get up again. So the point is, how do you learn from the experience of yourself and the experience of others and adapt and pivot and iterate your approach? So I'm going to pause here and I would, you know, again, my apologies due to the technical difficulties. I hope you're hearing me. I hope this is, you know, something that's food for thought. Um, I will see if I can share my slides in a moment and, you know, take you through this in a more constructive and systematic way. But I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions and if I can really address those uh, in a much more interactive way, because my style is not to give lectures, my style is to interact and have conversations. So I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to do that. So I don't know, Hannah, how, what you're thinking and how we can make this work, but um, you, I am in your hands and you give of me Of course. Some I'm not sure if everyone can see me or you need to add me to the stage. Can everyone see me? Um, I need someone to respond to me in the chat section. So this is the challenge of innovation. We're living. I in, know, right? right? It's yeah. like, that's what I said. It's like dealing with ups and downs. Experimenting it. So, uh, Dr. Perhoma, on the bottom, uh, do you see a plus? Uh, oh, I got a yes from Ali Reza. So you can see me, right, on the stage? I, I can see you, but I don't know if others can see you. We can you. see you. Perfect. Awesome. Technology. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. I think so this is actually good that the topic is innovation and entrepreneurship. Right, exactly. We, we are, are so agile. It. We are yeah. living it. Yeah. Right, and right. Is there a way for me to share my slides because that might be also another Yes. Helpful. So if you are in the backstage section, um, do you see these four uh, buttons? Yeah, I see at the bottom okay. these four icons. Yes, the one, the second one to the right. The second one to the right. Okay. Yes. Let me see. I'll click this and see where we get to. Um, does this allow hop in to observe your screen? Is that the correct? So after you click on that, you will see another Windows pop up. It says choose what to share and you can share your entire screen. Okay, I will see. Yes, actually, we can see. I can see your screen. 
you can see my screen, but I need to pull up my slides, which is behind me. So can I click on that? Yes. Okay. So let's see, you learn something new every day, right? Yes, that's right. So having, do you see this? Yes, okay. perfect. So let me just take you through the formal presentation that I put together for, for this session. So this is a little background on me. Um, I mentioned this to you, but I think it gives you a visual so you can look through it. Um, I wanted to ask you about innovation and entrepreneurship, what it means to you, but perhaps we can come to that when we get to the Q&A section. I wanted to show you this image. This is exactly what I mean about living at this key inflection point, the VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. This is a great time to be an innovator. This is a great time to be an entrepreneur because everything is up for grabs. The world is changing. We're at a key inflection point in society, in business, and new ways of thinking and challenging the status quo will be very critical for our success. This is what I meant by innovation. These are the three legs of the innovation paradigm that we think about, creativity, execution, and commercialization. And by the way, when we think about commercialization, this is of course for the for-profit um, innovations. It's not just about making money, but it's also about saving costs. Some innovations come about that actually save companies and people and organizations money. If you think of the retail sector, for example, we have seen so many innovations in retail sector. And one of the things that we see, for example, um, you know, what, why did Target become successful as a retail organization? Because it started offering goods at cheaper prices, right? How did Amazon get traction beyond books when it got started? Because people said it's cheaper and more convenient to buy from Amazon than to go to the local store. So keep these three themes at the back of your mind. Um, I was going to do a quick poll and see what is your innovation challenge in the VUCA world. But again, I don't want to add technical complexity to our conversation. So perhaps we can address that during our Q&A session. This is a quick summary of the business theories of innovation. And these are the five that I mentioned to you and I talked about, so I won't belabor them again. You can look at these books at your own convenience if you're interested. Um, Silicon Valley, the classic model of entrepreneurship. These are the three U's, urgent customer need, unique product or service, unified management team, um, small team. This is one of my favorites. If you're not motivated and hungry, if you don't have complementary skills, if you don't have a clear focus, it's not going to work. Um, leveraging advisors and the support infrastructure. This is about outsourcing. This is about using contractors. Flexibility, ability to adapt and iterate. Um, skin in the game, aligned incentives. Everybody sort of has talked about this so much is, you know, a lot of people join startups because they think they can also make money out of it, right? I'm joining a pre-IPO company, they say, and you know this is an opportunity for me to learn and to grow, but also hopefully if it succeeds, I can make money too. Um, baby steps and keeping it simple. This is one of my biggest, the biggest challenges that I've seen in startups is when they make things complicated. Um, really start with those baby steps, the simple things. That's why identifying your target users your target customers becomes really critical. And this is about the mindset, the mindset of realistic optimism. So what are the key success factors in driving innovation? Uh, mindset and inner drive. As I said, mindset is so critical for success. Um, I call this volunteer spirit because I think, um, you know, if you feel forced to do a startup, if you feel forced to innovate, if you think, well, I should do it because it's a flavor of the month or it's the fashion or my friends did it, this is not a good reason. The reason for innovation and entrepreneurship has to come from inside. It's got to be something you feel passionate about. As I said, you have to have a clear target. Don't take on the world. I was talking to an Italian entrepreneur who 
who actually has started in Silicon Valley and built a very successful company. And he, I said to him, why did you come to Silicon Valley? And he said to me, because when I was in Italy, I was focusing on five different ideas and I could never make up my mind. And I was pushing these five along at the same time. I came to Silicon Valley to talk to investors and try to raise money. And they said, we're not going to put a penny in you unless you pick one. We're not going to invest in you if you're trying to tackle five different things. It's not going to work. So having that clear, narrow scope, uh, that clear problem that you're trying to solve becomes really important. I cannot emphasize how important experimentation and iteration is. That's why I love the scientific mindset. This is about healthy paranoia. This is the Andy Grove book that I recommend. It's a classic. I think it's really important for you to look around corners, hedge your bets, look at external trends, look at potential competition that may arise and constantly learn in the process. And of course, you have to have engaged stakeholders as well. You have to have stakeholders who are champions um, and not fence sitters or cynics. So this goes to when you try to choose your investors, for example, your VCs. Uh, make sure that you choose the ones that, you know, really feel strongly about your idea and are not just sort of doing it because, you know, again, it's a sexy thing at that given point in time. So really being selective about the stakeholders and the investors you interact with is going to be really critical. This is a quick visual that shares the idea of the scientific process. As you can see, experiment, escalate, and integrate. And most startups go wrong because they really don't understand how to move from experimentation to escalation. And escalation means when you're scaling. When, for example, when Netflix went beyond the Bay Area, and tried to go across the United States, started selecting a few different states to penetrate, and then made it nationwide, and then went international. So you have to know what is the right time for you to really go beyond the narrow confines of your initial product or service and make it a little bit wider scope, whether it's your products or market coverage, and of course, in the process, you're also going to uh, increase the size of your team. So these are my tips for you as innovation leaders and as entrepreneurs. You know, focus, focus, focus. Have a clear purpose, a clear target. Think of the user or the customer's problem that you're trying to solve. Consider your own motivation. What do I want to get out of this initiative? What do I bring to this? What is my unique expertise? But I use the word motivation really carefully because I think this is where a lot of entrepreneurs go wrong. They think about the opportunity that they want to leverage, but they don't think about their own motivation. Why do I want to do it? And as I said, I cannot tell you how important this is because if you don't understand your motivation, you cannot put up with the setbacks the mistakes, the failures that you're inevitably going to experience in driving innovation. Keep the team small. Big teams are always a no-no when you get started for a, in a startup, in an entrepreneurial setting. I'm a big believer in senses, multiple senses. Talk to a lot of people. Surround yourself with a small team of expert advisors who can become your mentors, who know a lot more than you do and who can give you information that you may not already get. Take baby steps. Again, you see this repeated again and again. Communicate briefly and regularly. I have also seen entrepreneurs who basically fall out with their investors because they don't communicate uh, regularly. They sort of say, okay, we'll stick to our board meetings once a quarter. That is not a good idea. You need to keep in touch on a regular basis because you're dealing with a very dynamic reality. Mindset of realistic optimism, which means be persistent but open to input. 
And finally, view challenges, uh, view setbacks of challenges and learning opportunities. Several entrepreneurs that I know, very well-known serial entrepreneurs, interestingly enough, do not use the language of I fail. You know, we see a lot of um, literature around how failure is very important to entrepreneurship. And that is very true. But it's interesting, successful entrepreneurs frame this in their own heads, not as a failure, but as a setback. Now think about it. What's the difference between failure and setback? The difference is one seems to be the end of the line. I failed. This is it. The other one is much more temporary. When you say, I have a setback, it means you can do something about it. It's a challenge, something I need to overcome. And that's why resilience becomes so important for entrepreneurs and innovators. Anyway, there's a lot more written about this. If you're interested in this book, Super Flexibility for Knowledge Enterprises, um, you can go on the web and there's a lot of video stuff that you know I've put together that talks about different facets of my research and my work. But I'm going to pause here and see, Hannah, if we have any questions. Again, I my apologies, but we're living this notion of innovation real time in this setting. So um, I appreciate your patience and would love to hear any questions or comments that you may have. I know that this is not following your exact protocol. It's it's not exactly 15 minutes before our wrap up. It's, you know, 10 minutes extra. But I'm hoping that there will be some questions and comments. And I would just love to hear some voices. Of course. You Thank you so much, Dr. Homa. Really, uh, we enjoyed so much. I was taking notes and I took notes at all of it, like from mindset, idea, execution, the simple tools, the <laughs> Uh, the quote, all of it, and I really enjoyed so much. Thank you so much. Oh, it's and my I... pleasure. As I said, I mean, there's a this is a very, very rich topic. Honestly, it is not something that I can, you know, do justice in a right. <laughs> in a lecture because you know, obviously, you have to experience it, you have to experiment with it, but it is important to understand the foundational elements. Right. And as I said, the process is important. The mindset is important. And of course, the problem that you're solving is important. Does it really matter? Yeah, it? wonderful insights. Thank you so much. Can you please stop sharing your screen so you can click on the same button again? Okay. Then... Perfect. Thank okay. you. I'm learning. You see, I told you, <laughs> you need to be a student. You need to be a learner. <laughs> You're doing great. Um, so let's see if uh, anyone have any questions. Uh, we have one question from Puya. Mm. What is your recommendation to someone who is quite successful and comfortable with their current domain, but feels the itch to innovate in a completely new domain? Wants to innovate or... Just, yes. just repeat that second, but wants to innovate. But feels the each to innovate in a completely new domain. In a completely new domain. So I would say this is where baby steps really come in. Uh, start small. Uh, if you have an opportunity to join, for example, a nonprofit and act as a volunteer, my, my point is if it's a completely new domain, you don't want to tackle too many things all at once experiment. So join a voluntary, as a volunteer, join a nonprofit organization, even volunteer for an existing startup where you may have family and friends and start experimenting and trying out the, the you know, your itch to innovate. Um, because if you're comfortable doing what you're doing, it also depends on your risk appetite, honestly because I have had students who have left their comfortable jobs and they've said, I'm going to go and innovate. And, you know, they've realized that they've moved from their comfort zone suddenly to the danger zone, right? Uh, because as human beings, honestly, we have three zones around us. We have our comfort zone, we have our learning zone, and we have our danger zone. And what you want to do as somebody who's happy and comfortable, Puya, doing your current work, you want to move yourself to the learning zone. 
which is a baby step, something small that you experiment with, you build your confidence, and then you can decide, do I want to start my own company? Do I want to do my own thing? Uh, but, you know, start with that baby step, start with a volunteer opportunity, start with a nonprofit activity, something that is not a day job for you, um, helps you actually learn and experiment without taking too much risk. Now, if you happen to have a huge appetite for risk, then I would say, you know, you can say, okay, I know one entrepreneur who chucked a very good job, um, was an engineering leader in a big software company and had the itch to innovate. And basically um, said to himself that, um, I'm going to chuck this in. I'm an engineer, I'm in high demand. I'm going to try to do my own startup. And what's the worst case scenario? The worst case is it doesn't work out. I can get another job as an engineer. Now, that is someone who had a huge risk appetite, right? But many of us don't have that kind of a risk appetite. And that's why I'm offering you the baby step of working with a small startup, um, volunteering with a startup or a nonprofit and trying to, you know, put your hands at innovation in that setting, in that context. Thank you. Um, Puya had another question. I think he's looking for your um, contact. I, can I share my pitch deck with you? So what is the best way to reach out to you, Dr. Homa, if they so like So sorry, they, you want the, the deck that I just showed? Um, is Puya interested in the deck that I just showed? I How think so. You? All right. Um, let's go to this next question. So, so I just want to be clear. You, you, you would like me to send the deck. Just, just um, what is the best way to reach out to you? So I think if anyone have questions or they would like just to reach, reach out, out to by you. LinkedIn, I think that's the best way to reach out. Okay. To just find me on LinkedIn. Um, Perfect. And I think that's the best way to message me. Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and the next question is from Sarvanas. How do we find partners and convince them to join our team? Oh my God, this is such a good question. <laughs> How do we find partners and convince them to, to join, join our us. team? First of all, be very honest. Don't sugarcoat, right? When you, when you want somebody to join you, don't say, this is going to be the best thing since sliced bread and you should join us because we're going to do such great things together. A lot of people do that. And the problem with that is that you're raising expectations, right? And when you don't deliver on those expectations, guess what happens? The person is disappointed and they're going to leave. I cannot tell you how many situations I've seen where this has happened. The entrepreneur says, this is a fantastic thing. You must join us. We'll do this together. It's a little bit too optimistic. So don't do that. Be honest, be balanced. Say, this is what we're excited about. These are some of the challenges. Number two, tap into your network. You know, tap into the MENA network. Say, we're looking for partners with these qualities. You know, there was a study done by a colleague of mine at Berkeley back in the 90s comparing Silicon Valley with Route 128 in Boston, which is also a big center for innovation and entrepreneurship and has been historically. And But Silicon Valley has been much more successful in the sense that it's created many more startups, many more entrepreneurial ventures. And, you know, what she found was that there is one difference between these two places. In Silicon Valley, people network a lot. Whereas in Boston uh, or in Route 128, they tended to stick to their established network. So my suggestion, Sarvanas, is reach out. Reach out to a, go to your network and say, um, can you introduce me to three other people? who might be interested in this venture? Can you introduce me to two other people who might have an interest in this, who might have this kind of a skill set? Networking is a very important part of identifying the people who might be the right candidates for your team. And of course, in today's COVID age, it's not so easy to network in person. So you have to find other ways of doing it, right? So don't sugarcoat, 
leverage the network and the network's network. And then thirdly, be very clear about what you're offering and what you expect, right? If you join us, we expect 24 seven, this is a startup. We want you to work really hard. So please don't join us if work life balance is really important to you, right? You've got to be really clear about what you expect from them and what you instead you're giving back to them. So many startup entrepreneurs that I know are really good at these three areas. They're brilliant at networking. They're very good at setting expectations, honestly, and they're very good at being upfront about what they expect from the individual, the skill set, the work hours, the way to approach, um, you know, problem solving, um, et cetera, et cetera. So those would be a few initial thoughts that come to my mind. But I would say, you know, be be very clear about what you want and what you don't want right it's just as important to be clear about what you don't want because you know that will rule out a lot of people you will talk to but may not be the right fit for your situation thank you this was a uh... One of my questions, because it's so difficult to build a team that you want, especially if you want to have a founding members and have yeah, that, like, I mean, chemistry. Want, absolutely. If you want to have founders, I mean, the biggest, you know, one of the things we do at Berkeley is, um, you know, our students, we try to create an environment where our students, for example, from business and engineering can come together in a classroom setting and do common projects on innovation and entrepreneurship. So that is another approach for both of you, if you want to do that, is sign up for a course. Um, sign up for a course on this, pick a place, and just make sure you do your due diligence because you may find your co-founders sure. in that course. Uh, you don't have to come and do an MBA. You don't have to come and do a master's. You know, there's many accelerators that are around if you're in the California area, particularly in the Bay Area. You can apply to those, you know, um, uh, 50 startups or Y Combinator. There's so many of some. These are some of the famous ones. But you can also go to those and use the accelerators as opportunities to meet your co-founders and find your teams. This is the networking piece, of course. Right. 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 Thank you so much. Um, is there any other question? Um, I don't see any question. If you have any question, you can write it down either in the Q&A section or the chat section under stage or event. OK, I will ask my question then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have so many questions because I was like listening to you and I enjoyed a lot. I got my entrepreneurship degree from Harvard Business School, but I was like, oh, my God, I'm learning again. I want to audit courses and listen to Dr. Holm again and again. Oh, that's um, sweet of you. No, I'm, I, you know, this is this is a very um, area of very great interest to me because, you know, so ever since I moved to California from England back way back in the 1980s, you know, one of the things that really interested me was, you know, in England, I had studied 21 multinational corporations, which were these giant wow. industrial age companies like BP or Shell or Capital Web. So these kind of giant. And then I came here and as a young student and you know, it was the sort of early stages of Silicon Valley. I told you, Sandy Lerner, the co-founder of Cisco, was was the IT manager at Stanford, where I wow. she gave me my first email account. So I was very fortunate. I felt that I had a ringside seat, you know, watching these great entrepreneurs and innovators of the time. So that was the beginning of my interest in really entrepreneurship and innovation. What makes this place tick? How do these people think? What is right. the recipe for success? What is the recipe for failure? And so on. So that's um, amazing. No, I can understand your passion because I think <laughs> it's something that's very infectious. That's amazing. Thank you for all of your tips. So what is your suggestion if you want to particularly um, advise female entrepreneurs how to represent themselves? Because this is like, especially in Silicon Valley, so male dominant. Yes. And I've noticed even when you go for investors or raising, even the questions they ask sometimes is different. So what is your suggestion in this I regard? think it's a great question. I, I honestly do think we have a way to go to provide you know, if you like, equal opportunity. But I think things are getting better. 
I think as the younger generation, as your generation is coming in, um, I think it's really changing the dynamics. I've really seen that myself. Some of the younger investors, for example, think very differently than more established investors who might have been used to all the ways of doing things. So I have three tips. Tip number one is be, how can I put this in a way that makes sense? Be confident, but not arrogant, right? In the sense that don't go in there from a position of weakness and say, oh, I'm a woman and they're going to look at me differently. Don't go into this with that mindset. If you go into it with that mindset, you act like that, right? You act from a position of weakness. So go into it and really do your own reflection and say, you know, I feel confident that this is something that, you know, um, I'm good at. This is something I can bring value to the party. Um, so com your own confidence and how you project that is important. Um, it's not good to be on either side of the confidence equation. You know, at Berkeley, in the business school, we have a guiding principle which says confidence without attitude. But I see a lot of women entrepreneurs tend to go into it from a position of weakness. Don't do that. Feel good about yourself. Feel good about who you are and what you're bringing to the party. So this is that mindset piece, right? <laughs> Which you cannot engineer or induce. Number two, be very clear about your strengths and your weaknesses. Very clear. Um, and, you know, if you be balanced in that, so don't go there and sugarcoat, you know, you're not the greatest guy, you know, person on earth. You know, this is three things I bring to the party. These are a couple of things that I'm going to look for my team to augment my capabilities, right? But be, be clear about what you're bringing. What is your conviction? What is your point of view? What is your strength? right? Your due diligence on yourself is really, really important. So that would be my advice number two. And three, tap into the support system. There are a lot of women entrepreneurs, senior leaders in industry. This is, again, goes back to the network, right? Use them as mentors, use them as sounding boards, you know, try to ask them, you know, if I had to go to investors, who do you suggest I go to who are more women friendly, for example, right? Who are the ones who've already invested in women? And now we're seeing some funds coming about that are just investing in women entrepreneurs. So tap into the community to identify the right segments to go to and don't treat every investor as the same. They're not. So this takes a lot of due diligence. People ask me this question a lot, but I think it really starts with you. It starts with how you feel about yourself and are you coming from a position of confidence or are you coming from a position of, oh, I'm a woman, you know, um, I can't do this and they're going to look at me funnily. I, if you go into it that way, you're going to behave that way. So don't do that. Very true. Thank you. Um, let me see if we have more questions. Uh, if anyone, again, um, if you have questions, I mean, if I were in your class, I would ask like a million questions. No, right I think now. it's honestly the, the platform also is, you know. It's yes, a it's a little bit boggy. Class, it's very different dynamic than when you're looking at a screen, right? So I can understand people's um, people's concerns. Because you were very clear and your lecture and webinar basically had everything in it. Well, you I covered just everything. Kind of cover a big territory. Very, I very I didn't great. confuse people <laughs> because That's I knew why. we had a limited time together and I wanted to share with you as much as I could. So I hope Thank this was you. helpful. And, you know, they don't need to have questions. All I would say is, you know, whatever you decide to do in life, whether you decide to be an innovator or an entrepreneur or just do something more traditional, 
um, really tune into your motivation and your wish list. This is something that I've seen in my students who've been very successful over the years. Um, they really understand themselves very well. They do a lot of self-reflection. What makes me tick? What am I good at? What do I want out of life? What don't I want out of life? So I think a lot of the times we just look to others, but we don't look inside ourselves. And we don't think about, you know, somebody said to me, for example, why didn't you become an entrepreneur? Well, I know myself. I know that I love learning and I love teaching and I love helping others learn and succeed, right? I'm more of a mentor. I'm more of a um, guide than I am an entrepreneur. Uh, but I am an entrepreneur in my classes, right? I start new courses. I start new classes. I do new things. So it doesn't need to be just in business or in nonprofit, it can be in your home. You can be an entrepreneur and an innovator at home. I'm seeing, for example, I know one actual Iranian lady in, in Arizona who um, started her own home catering business and started with family and friends. She's a wonderful cook. And she started cooking for family and friends and that led to her own catering business. And today she's got a very successful catering business cooking Persian style food and combining it with other things for banquets, for weddings. And she's got a big team and it all started with that tiny uh, home cooked meals that she did for family and friends. So really this doesn't need to be something that is just about VCs and, you know, famous entrepreneurs. It can be just really for everyday situations. Right. Very well said. We are all entrepreneurs as long as we are living our life. We are experimenting. We are doing a lot of things at home, at work. We have one more question. I think we can take this as our last question. Sure. Um, if you are okay with that. Absolutely. Have five sure. minutes. How do I know my new idea is a nice have or must have? Oh, you have to test drive it with potential customers or users. This is the golden rule of entrepreneurship. If you don't go out there and test drive it with your early adopters. So identify three groups of people you can go and talk to and say to them, I'm thinking about this. Um, would you... Is this something you're interested in? If you're interested in this, would you pay money for it? If it's a for-profit, for example. If it's a non-profit, would you join our community? Is this something of interest that you would feel strongly enough to become a member or to become a volunteer? The only way you can differentiate between must-have and would be nice to have is to test drive the idea with those who are going to use it. They will tell you if you have a headache if this is an Advil or a Tylenol or if this is a vitamin pill. That is not necessarily going to do your headache a lot of good. So that is the only way you can figure it out. Go out there and test drive it. It's interesting when we teach um, entrepreneurship classes, this is one of the first things we do. We say to the students, okay, you have an idea, find 10 people who could be potential users, go and interview them and ask them if they're interested in this. And if they're interested in this, would they buy it and pay for it? Um, and just compare notes across the board. If you're talking to 10 people and two of them say yes and eight of them say no, it tells you that you should move towards these users. If all of them say absolutely this is a must have, then you know you're on to something. And if none of them say, it's, it's interesting, but no, I'm not going to go out of my way to buy it. Then you know that you might have to iterate. So that would be my suggestion. That is the best way to differentiate. Okay, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm sorry about the technical glitches. It's, you know, we're all learning as we go along. We're all in this space of innovation and I wish Mina and all of you as, as, as entrepreneurs and innovators every success. And remember, enjoy the journey. This is not something that is, you know, good to do because, you know, it's popular or it's fashionable. It's got to be something that feels right in your heart and in your soul.
So enjoy the thank journey. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and accepting our invitation. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I will end this event by this famous quote that Dr. Homa said, it is not the strongest or the most intelligent that ultimately survive. It is the most adaptable. Thank you, everyone, Absolutely. for being here. Thank you, Dr. Homa. Thank you if so much. Anyone have any question, please send us email at Bayeria at Women of Men and Technology. Have a wonderful rest of day. Thanks so much. Take care of Thank yourselves. Thank you. Bye-bye.